seven Marines carrying each casket from an Air Force C-17 transport, bringing them to a hangar filled not just with leaders, not just commanders and dignitaries, but comrades and colleagues, family and friends. The killings in Benghazi of Ambassador Christopher Stevens, Foreign Service Officer Sean Smith, and former Navy SEALs Glenn Doherty and Tyrone Woods has become part of a political battle back home. There was not even a hint of that here, of course. Among those in attendance, Colin Powell, Secretary of State during the last administration. The current Secretaries of State and Defense were present. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton saying the four lives lost were, li were lived in service to their country and are, in her words, at the heart of what makes America great and good. President Obama vowed to bring their killers to justice and not shrink from commitments around the world. The United States of America will never retreat from the world. We will never stop working for the dignity and freedom that every person deserves, whatever their creed, whatever their faith. That's the essence of American leadership. That's the spirit that sets us apart from other nations. This was their work in Benghazi, and this is the work we will carry on. President Obama today talking about the mission that so many Americans do and what four Americans died doing. We put them front and center tonight. Ambassador Christopher Stevens, Sean Smith, Glenn Doherty, and Tyrone Woods. Joining me now on the phone is Ambassador Stevens' stepfather, Robert Comande. Uh, Mr. Comande, I'm, I'm so sorry for, for your loss, and, and please uh, extend our condolences to your inf entire family. W what do you want people to know about your stepson? Well, I think what we learned today uh, it tells me what his legacy was. At the Anderson Air Force Base, when the uh, uh, caskets were brought back, 800 members of the State Department were there. And the president spoke for the first time. He spoke at one of these ceremonial dignified transfers, and Secretary Clinton spoke. And uh, they all expressed the understanding that Chris's commitment to Libya and to the country uh, has left a legacy that will live after him. So this is what I'd like people to know, that he was beloved by his colleagues in the State Department and, and, and from the people of Libya. The Libyan ambassador came and spoke to us, came and spoke to us, and, and uh, so did Barack Obama, was uh, very kind. All of this was, was representing the feeling of the government towards this wonderful son of ours. And that, I think, speaks for itself. He, he probably could have had a, a cushy posting. He probably could have had, uh, at this point in his career, a, a, a much safer posting. It, he seemed like the kind of ambassador who really wanted to be out there with people out there on the streets with his sleeves rolled up. Yes, he, but he loved Libya as, un, as unbeautiful as it is. And the, the, the ambassador uh, uh, expressed his deep affection for Chris and the messages we've, we've gotten from Libya and, and the signs in the streets of counter protest proclaiming Chris Stevens with Libya. And that, that to me says it all. There, there's been such, obviously, an outpouring of, uh, of, of thoughts and, and prayers for your family and, and, and reflections upon him. I talked to Senator McCain about, about, your, steps, uh, about your stepson earlier. Um, we heard, obviously, from Secretary Clinton and, and obviously, comments from President Obama. Uh, there's also been an outpouring among people on the streets of Libya. There have been demonstrations in support of the United States and, 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 and apologizing. When you saw those pictures, did, how does that make you feel? Pardon to me that, that it confirms how uh, affectionate people were there towards him and grateful that, that he worked so hard for their liberation. And that's to me what he represented to them. Um, I, I, I can't imagine what this day has been like for you, and, and I appreciate you taking the time to, um, to, to, talk, to, to talk to us and, and let us know a little bit more about, about your stepson. Thank you. Our hearts are filled with with gratitude and grief. Uh, I, I, Thank I, you, sir. Thank you. Well, sadly, there's more turmoil today and more American lives in jeopardy. Friday, the Muslim day of prayer was anything but tranquil. Violence erupting now for a fourth straight day in Egypt. 
More violence as well in Sudan, Yemen, Gaza, and Syria. Protests as far away as Afghanistan and in Tunisia, birthplace of the Arab Spring. At least three people have been killed in clashes between rioters and security forces in and around the U.S. Embassy. Some managed to get into the complex, tearing down American flags, raising their own. The ambassador and his staff, though, are reported to be safe under protection of Marines and Tunisian anti-terror troops. In Libya, meantime, four suspects are now in custody in connection with Tuesday's killings. For the latest in the chaos, the investigation and any possible warning signs of trouble before the attacks, we turn to Arwa Damon, who is in Benghazi, Libya, for us who's got some new and disturbing information that may help explain the deadly outcome. Also, Ben Wiedemann, who's in Cairo, and you can hear the demonstrations behind him. And in Washington, CNN National Security contributor Fran Townsend. She's a member of the CIA External Advisory Committee. Last uh, month, Fran visited Libya with her employer, McAndrews and Forbes. Arwa, right, let's start with you in Benghazi, Libya. Uh, you went to the scene at the U.S. consulate. You're also getting reports about a possible leak of information to the terrorists or the militants that carried out this attack. What have you learned? We are hearing details now about a second attack that took place at a different location. This is coming from the spokesman for one of the battalions here that is part of the February 17th brigade. This is a brigade, according to this one spokesman, that actually helped evacuate personnel from the location of the consulate to what was supposed to have been a safe house, but a few hours after all of this took place, in the early hours of the morning, a unit of security personnel arrived at the Benghazi airport from Tripoli. These were Americans tasked with evacuating, we are being told, those who were hiding out at the safe house. As this convoy was approaching the safe house, they came under yet another intense but very short-lived attack. And this is where many questions are being asked as to was somehow, was there some sort of infiltration that took place? How did the attackers know to then strike at the second location? Now, when these uh, individuals arrived to this second location, this apparent safe house, we are being told that they found around 30-plus personnel that needed to be evacuated, along with three of the four bodies. The body of the ambassador was, of course, later found at the hospital, but a lot of questions, Anderson, as we're trying to really piece together how it is that this happened, but also how is it going to be prevented in the future? Yeah, and our, one of the questions I have is, I mean, it sounds like this was a, a, a fight that went on for some time, or an attack that went on some, some time. Where were local Libyan security forces, either government forces, or we keep hearing about there's so many militias around, and if, if, you know, there's good feeling toward the U.S., why weren't other militias responding to to an attack on, on the U.S. consulate. Do we know any of those answers? We know some of them. Others we're still trying to dig for. What we have heard is that the Deputy Minister of Interior, who's effectively responsible for the eastern portion of the country, actually called his specific forces away from the location of the consulate as the attack was taking place because they quite simply were unable to put up a fight. Well, we are also being told that it is elements from the 17th of February brigade that did, in fact, try to help, try to help defend the location of the council. And as I was saying, they're the ones that were being told eventually helped evacuate the personnel from that initial location. But there are a lot of questions for the Libyan government at this point in time, because, yes, there are a number of armed militias around. There are a number of militias who do support the United States, along with those, as is very evident, who do not. These extremist militias out there are very intent on sabotaging this nation and its movement down the direction that the revolution intended it to be set on. Uh, ben, there have been protests uh, th uh, in Cairo and, and throughout in different parts of Egypt. What is the latest? What are, what are you hearing? What are you seeing? Well, right below us right now, the uh, protesters seem to have retaken uh, this street right next to the American embassy. And uh, the area is really thick with tear gas. Earlier in the day, the Egyptian security forces set up a concrete barrier right about 100 yards from the American embassy, which stopped the protesters from getting much closer. But that hasn't really stopped the clashes which have been going on all day long here. The security forces keeping the protesters away from the embassy, but not really able to push the protesters far away. Every time they push forward, uh, the protesters push back, and it's really been like that uh, all day long. Anderson? And Ben, are these kind of the, the young men you were talking about last night who 
um, you know, are kind of often at protests. Who is it now who's protesting? The same young men. Most of these young men don't appear to be uh, members of any of the main political parties like the Muslim Brotherhood or the Salafi Noor party. Uh, many of them, I think, are what are called ultras, which are basically football hooligans who very much get off on this. They're really just high on adrenaline in these clashes uh, with the police. When you speak to them, they, of course, will say the reason they're protesting is that they want to see the American ambassador the Israeli ambassador expelled from the country. They want to see an end to relations between the United States and uh, Egypt as a result of this uh, YouTube video uh, that, of course, is at the center of this controversy. But they don't seem to have much in the way of any political ideas other than those very sort of crude uh, anti-American sentiments. Uh, if, they, if they've retaken that street, Ben, I'm going to let you go so you can get off that balcony uh, and get back inside. I appreciate, Ben, you being with us. Fran, there, there have been questions about intelligence that, that could have prevented this attack in Libya. You've been working your security sources. What have you been able to find out? You know, Anderson, so American intelligence officials will say to you that until very recently, the focus of the Libyan government and Lib Libyan security forces had been anti-Gaddafi loyalists. And remember, at, right after the, the immediate aftermath of the tragedy on September 11th and the killing of Ambassador Stevens, we did hear uh, that there was concern by Libyan officials about anti-Gaddafi, uh, pro-Gaddafi loyalists. Now, they said, in, in around the end of August, and when I was there, Anderson, on a business trip, Everyone I spoke to, Libyan officials and American officials, all talked about their growing concern about extremists in Darna, a city to the east of Benghazi, where they believed extremists, Islamists, were gaining strength and they were heavily armed. Unfortunately, it turns out that that was a valid concern. They just, I never have gotten the sense that they had any, any idea that there was such an immediate and specific threat against the consulate. In fact, they suggested my going to visit that consulate. And, and, and despite protests, Fran, I mean, spreading throughout the Middle East today, um, you say some people in the administration may be breathing a sigh of relief. Why? Well, security officials across the U.S. government, what you were seeing now in Egypt, what we saw in Tunisia, I think they were prepared for the worst. That is, the protests worldwide would all take on that sort of very violent, extreme threat to the embassies and posts. I think there was some sense of relief. They were glad they were prepared, but they didn't see that widespread violence um, that we're now, we saw in Tunisia and we're now seeing more of in Egypt. Uh, Fran, I appreciate uh, you working your sources. Arwa Damon as well and Benghazi. Uh, please be careful and, and Ben Weinman as well. We're on Facebook. Follow us there on Twitter as well at Anderson Cooper. I'm tweeting tonight. When we come back, new allegations being leveled at the Obama administration, including this shocker that scenes like this wouldn't be happening if Mitt Romney were president. We'll tell you who said that. We'll keep it honest.